What you're currently looking at is a moving platform inertial navigation system. It was developed in the 60s for the F-104 Starfighter to help it navigate towards targets on a mission. And in this video, we're going to learn what makes this device such an incredible solution to a problem that humanity has been facing for hundreds of years. And not only does it solve the problem, it does this in such a genius and clever way that makes this device one of my favourite examples of aerospace engineering. So what makes them look so complicated, how do they work, and why is the military interested in using them? This system has one very important goal, and that is to figure out the position of the vehicle that it's attached to. By calculating the vehicle's location, inertial navigation systems can not only be used to guide aircraft along a route, but also missiles towards a target, and even a rocket into space. Now the mysterious thing about these contraptions is that they work independently from the outside world, meaning that they do not rely on things like satellites or radio signals. This makes them unique because traditionally aircraft use all sorts of connections with ground stations to help figure out where they are. Inertial navigation, on the other hand, is kind of like a stubborn teenager who refuses any help from the outside world whatsoever. The fact that these systems can operate all on their own also makes them very attractive to the military, since a satellite or a radio station could always be destroyed by someone who does not have your best interests in mind. But if you're like me, this may feel a little bit weird. I mean, how is it possible to determine where you are if you're not using your surroundings? It's like dropping a person without a map in the middle of an unknown forest and just expecting them to somehow know the way. Some of the first people to try and figure out this problem were European explorers in the Middle Ages. The main instrument sailors used was a magnetic compass, but a compass alone does not tell you what your location is. This is a genuinely tough problem to solve, and one of the ways that sailors navigated the vast oceans at the time was through a method called dead reckoning. So imagine you're a Dutch sailor out at sea, trying to find a new route across the Atlantic Ocean. As your ship leaves Amsterdam, you locate yourself on the map by simply looking for, well, Amsterdam. Thereafter, you decide to embark on your long and treacherous journey by heading west and following your compass to the Americas. Since we know where both North and Amsterdam are on our map, we can draw a line heading west from our initial point of departure. Now in real life, the chances of you following this line perfectly are of course almost zero. But let's just take this as an example for a second. If we're following our compass perfectly and we neglect things like ocean currents, then we know that we must be somewhere on this line, since we started off at a known location. You can imagine that over time we're probably going to be further and further away from Amsterdam depending on how fast our ship is sailing. So if we know something about the velocity of our ship and the amount of time that has passed since we initially left the harbour, then we can calculate where we are on this line by simply multiplying time and speed. And funnily enough, the way sailors measured their speed was by throwing a piece of rope with knots overboard and timing how long it would take until a certain number of knots were pulled into the water behind the ship. This is why almost every plane on the planet, to this day, still uses knots to measure airspeed. Although it's unlikely that you'll see your captain throwing a piece of rope out of the cockpit anytime soon. Okay, but how does all of this relate to inertial navigation systems? The type of system that you can see on screen right now is one example of a moving platform INS. The center platform is supported by three gimbals, which allows it to rotate in all three directions. The outer one does roll, the middle one does pitch, and the inner circle does yaw. Notice that even though the outer gimbal is attached to the frame of the aircraft, the inner platform always maintains a constant orientation relative to the horizon. This is important for later on. The same way a sailor has a compass and a rope with knots, the INS also has five main instruments, consisting of three accelerometers and two gyroscopes, which you can see here. 
The three accelerometers are basically doing the same thing as a sailor who is measuring the speed of a ship with a rope. Except this time we're not measuring speed, but we're measuring how the speed changes over time. This is really useful since aircraft are of course a lot more maneuverable than big and heavy ships. Imagine that you're sitting in the back of a parked car blindfolded. As the car starts moving, you suddenly feel pushed into the back of your seat, which leads your brain to conclude that the car is accelerating forward, even though you can't see anything. Moments later, you suddenly feel the weight of your body shift to the right, which gives you the impression that you're in a left-hand turn. So even though you haven't been able to see which direction the car's been going in, you already have an intuitive sense of what your route looks like. And all of this is only possible because your body has a certain amount of weight and inertia. This is why these navigation systems are called inertial. It's because inertia is what allows us to sense movement even when we cannot see what's going on outside of our bodies. And that's exactly what's going on with our three accelerometers, which are continuously providing new data to update our location, the same way a sailor keeps track of his position and route. This is also the reason why inertial navigation systems are sometimes referred to as modern dead reckoning, because they're essentially doing the same thing as our ancestors did, except way more accurately. So now we know why the accelerometers are on this platform, why does the platform itself need to tilt? Let's go back to the example of our blindfolded car passenger. If the car is parked on an uphill slope, you will of course feel as if you're being pushed into your seat. And you may be thinking, well, surely I could tell the difference between a car that is accelerating and a car that is parked on an uphill slope. But here's the thing. If your eyes are closed and you have no other reference aside from the force of your seat, then there is simply no possible way for you to tell which of these situations applies to you. And this isn't just a limitation of your body or your perception, this is a limitation of the physics of our universe, which means it also applies to our accelerometers. So coming back to our pitching aircraft, we now have to face a similar problem. If we attach our accelerometers to the frame of the aircraft, as soon as we start pitching upwards, the accelerometer will feel as if it is being pulled backwards. This is because a portion of gravity is now pulling in the backwards direction. And this is a big problem, because if we take a look at what the accelerometer is telling us, there is no way to know if it can be trusted or not, since gravity is now also playing a role in our measurement. So one of the solutions to this tilting problem is to always align the accelerometers with the horizon, because that way gravity will never interfere with our measurements. We do this by placing all our instruments on a moving platform, which is the reason we need all these gimbals. We can then use gyroscopes to tilt the platform such that it always stays level, regardless of how the aircraft is moving around it. Gyroscopes are essentially spinning wheels which always want to keep their orientation fixed, no matter what is happening outside of them. This makes them the perfect instrument for our platform, given that we want to keep it fixed relative to the horizon inside a rotating aircraft. Although gyroscopes are great at correcting for the rotation of the aircraft, they're actually too good. If you were to fly from the equator to the North Pole holding a gyroscope, from your perspective it would seem as if the gyro was drifting or wandering. This is due to two reasons. Firstly, due to the rotation of the Earth, the gyro will seem as if it is building up an error. Whereas actually, it's doing exactly what it was supposed to by keeping itself at a constant orientation relative to where it started off from. And secondly, due to the curvature of the Earth, if we fly from A to B, the gyro will again keep itself aligned with whatever its original orientation was. But in both cases, this means that the platform will no longer be aligned with the horizon, which unfortunately for us is exactly the issue we've been trying to solve the entire time. And in our frustration, this is where the magic happens. 
So to compensate for these rotations, we use the accelerometers to give us our position and velocity in real time. This then allows us to continuously correct the gyroscopes, literally on the fly, to make sure that they're following the rotation of the Earth and keeping the platform aligned with the horizon at all times. And because we're now keeping the platform level, in turn, this means that the accelerometers can do their job properly without accidentally measuring gravity as we saw earlier. And the incredible thing is that the feedback between the accelerometers, the gyros, the gimbals, and the platform are what allows the INS to continuously correct itself during flight with its own live data. The constant cooperation between all these instruments is what allows inertial navigation systems to navigate independently, and it's a beautiful example of what humans can do if we set our mind to it. Huge thanks to Olaf for letting me use his videos, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.